Hello, welcome to the Spittoon Arts Collective podcast. This is the second instalment. My name is Matthew Byrne. I am the founder of Spittoon. And it's a great pleasure today to interview Anthony Tao, the coordinator of the Spittoon Beijing Collective. How are you today, Anthony? I'm doing well, Matt. It's good to be with you on uh, this evening or your afternoon. That's correct, yes. Uh, what are you drinking there? Can you tell us a little, little bit about the tipple that you are currently consuming? Uh, this is uh, this is Le Chang, Le Chang. So it's spelled with a D, L E E A I G, Le Chang Ten. It's a nice peated Highland, Highland whiskey. Ah, it's a Highland whiskey. You're you're a fan of the whiskeys. Uh, I remember you've got quite quite a shelf over there in your apartment. Is that right? I am. You can see um you can see a bit of it here. Let me see. Let me see. If I can turn the screen a little bit for you to see more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Please. that's like half of it. Man. I can't turn my screen anymore, but. Um, yeah, I, I'm a fan of the, uh, particularly the single malts, but you know, I've got a couple of bourbon and a rye up there as well. I'm, I'm a big fan of the single malts, the peatiness, uh, it's almost as if they have more character than triple distilled, although I'm sure that's sacrilege to a certain amount of people. What's your favorite whiskey? What's my favorite whiskey? Um, the, the, the name that's burned into my mind when you asked me that question is Lefroig. Um, we were talking about it just before, the Isle whiskey, um, just because of its intense peat and peatiness. And it's also quite ubiquitous as well. You can buy it in lots of normal pubs. So it's like it, it strikes that balance of being accessible and, and high quality. Um, but I've also been using the, the last few months to order whiskies online to try um, in my apartment. The most recent single malt was Bunna Habane. I'm not saying it correctly, um, but it's a really, really nice whiskey. Um, also quite easy, easily accessible as well. I actually have two Buna Robins. Uh, the Strudevar, I uh, got that one, which is their non-age statement one. And then the Buna Robin 12, and they're both, they're both excellent. They're both Islas, so much like before I it's an Isla, but they're both unpeated. Yeah, they matured in sherry casks, right? You, you've got the sort of like fruitiness to the sort of dark fruit flavor. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, I think it's actually a good segue because your interest in whiskey is actually itself created events at what was formerly known as the Bookworm Cafe. So I think that's a good way to kind of like segue into your connection with that institution. But before we do that, actually, I'm going to embarrass you slightly by reading your bio, your biography, uh, which is featured on the Spittoon WeChat uh, platform. So just to add context to our hungry viewers. I hope it's updated. Um, yeah, what's well, the most recent? Anthony Tao, that's you, is currently the coordinator of Spittoon Beijing. His poetry has appeared in journals such as Rattle, Prairie Schooner, The Courtland Review, Frontier, Asian Cha, etc. He is part of Poetry X Music Band, which uh, you can find on poetryxmusic.com, and shares his poetry via the Poetry from Beijing newsletter, which is anthonytao.substack.com. So I think that's a, a fairly um, a fairly good sort of recent purview of what you've been up to. Would you agree? Is there anything you want to add to that immediately after hearing it? Yeah, yeah. There's some old stuff on there and there's some new stuff. Uh, it's funny. I think that was one of the, um, I think, I think the first part of that was um, one of the earliest bios that I'd sent to you when I was participating in um, Poetry Night. And you've always mispronounced Prairie Schooner, Schooner, and I've never corrected you. I should point it out now. Regional dialects, you know. Yes, yeah. yes. So, um, yeah, I think that we've, we've already, within this small amount of time, managed to touch on a few things. We've talked about your affiliation with Spittoon. Um, and your love of whiskey. So I want to kind of like emphasize that segue into the uh, larger Spittoon literary sphere. Um, and we've mentioned the Bookworm Cafe, but I think that maybe we can approach this chronologically, right? Because uh, I know that you've been in Beijing for a long time. You have history with the city. Um, so if it's okay with you, Anthony, uh, I'd like to trouble you to give me a kind of short uh, introduction about yourself, and perhaps you can talk about you know your family as well. I think that you uh, you have uh, connections here beyond your recent experience. So 
the floor is yours. Please, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, I was born in Beijing and uh, my parents left uh, when I was pretty young uh, to go study in the U.S. They both got scholarships to study at the University of Kansas and they were never supposed to stay there permanently. They were going to come back, but um, 89 happened, you know, June 4th and um, their outlook on China turned fairly bleak. So uh, I instead went to them in the uh, spring of 1990. And then, um, you know, that's how, that's how, you know, U.S. citizenship here and American accent, uh, Prairie Schooner, I'm pronouncing it Schooner, all that stuff. Uh, but I came back to Beijing in 2008 to cover the Olympics. And I was um, basically just freelancing for ESPN, the magazine at the time. Um, I had, uh, you know, I had previously been, um, I was working at ESPN in New York as a freelancer, as, as, a, uh, as a researcher, fact checker. But then 2008 happened, so I just came and I decided um, to basically send them weekly reports. Uh, and then when that Olympics ended, um, I remained just because it, you know, it was more exciting in Beijing. There, were, there seemed to be more op opportunities. It was a little bit more dynamic. Um, and I never really, I never thought that I would be here for another Olympics. But of course, the Beijing 2022 games just ended not too long ago under very different circumstances. You know, Beijing 2008 was the most liberal, progressive um, time for this city and probably for this country uh, in recent memory. And uh, in 2022, while well, the differences um, are drastic, uh, I don't know if we want to get into that now, but uh, but in in my um, I guess it's fourteen years now, and just thinking about that number, um, you know, it was <laughs> the fourteen years passed really one year at a time because uh, there aren't that many people, I think, uh, especially people who are young who come to Beijing who um, who who stay because they find it fun and dynamic they don't plan really long term um there are a couple exceptions of course but i'd always taken it a year at a time sort of partly just because my visas were always a year or two or three years long and i had to keep renewing it but um the thing about the city is uh there was there would always be something different that would give me a reason to stay and that reason would change i think about every three or four years you know um, so, so what I'd like to say is I've really lived three or four very different lives, um, in the last 14. Um, but, but for, for most of it, maybe for the, I, I guess I should say for the latter half of that, of my time here, um, the, uh, the literary arts and the creative community has been, has played a really big role. And I think right now, the, the thing, the most important thing keeping me here, and you alluded to this when you read my bio, I would say is Poetry X Music. Excellent, okay. Um, some really interesting points there, and uh, you definitely hit a note when you talk about the sort of sequential uh, effect that living in China has. Um, it's, um, it's a vague analogy. Uh, Matt, can I, uh, yeah? I just gotta cut you off really quick. I can't believe, you know, you were talking about segues earlier and nailing the segues. Uh, I, uh, you know, I was trying to segue to, or at least to, to pass the baton to you to talk about how you were the person who was responsible for Poetry X Music getting together in the first place. Yeah. Well, if you weren't going to bring it up, I certainly am. <laughs> yeah. So um, for the purposes of this podcast, Poetry X Music, which we can talk about in, in a bit more detail uh, later, is the, um, is the Poetry Music Partnership originally between Anthony Tao and Leanne Holton that was brought together through Spittoon's Spit Tunes project, um, which is the poetry music collaboration project that we created. And, uh, you know, I'm personally very proud, obviously, and I think Spittoon is as well about the success of your, your partnership with Leanne and also with the rest of the band. I think there's about five of you now, um, and you are, you've done your second album and presumably you're working on mu more music now, which you can perhaps tell us about um, right now actually but to, just to finish it's uh, it's one partnership among um, a collection of partnerships that we've created over the last few years and uh, really speaks to the 
uh, the mercurial adaptability of poetry in relation to other art forms, uh, which is perhaps a major ingredient in its future survival, um, because I think that a lot of people don't consume it um, for, for news or art or, or entertainment as much as previous generations, but uh, its survivability may, you know, last in, for, for the larger, larger population may, you may see it in, you know, collaboration forms with music or various other things. So um, just to address what you talked about before, before we expound on your personal projects as well, it's, you just struck a note in relation to the, to the life in Beijing. I've, I've heard you say many a times if we've, as we've drunk together um, in the past that um, you, you seem to encapsulate the kind of joy and sadness of Beijing in terms of the uh, fruitful opportunities that people have in creating projects, having time and disposable income for those projects and meeting people from around the world. But then the inevitable closing of those friendships, um, not, not killing the friendships, but, you know, kind of ending ending an era of friendship and an era of projects because people people leave the city um you know especially within the expat culture uh that we had um and that was the kind of that kind of like rolodex carousel is what we experienced together and that seems to encapsulate the kind of um unfortunate aspect to the lifestyle that um you have different eras, don't you? To kind of extrapolate from that, the the era that we're both used to, which is the the art scene, you know, the bookworm literary festival, um, our, our efforts through Spittoon. I want to talk a little bit about um, where you were before I knew you, because um, when when I did meet you, you were already established in the sort of Beijing art literary scene. You were running the uh, Bookworm Literary Festival, and I know that the drum roll up to that was your work with Beijing Cream, right? So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. What what was that project, and what did it seek to achieve? Sure. Um, um, just if, just to add on the point um, what you were talking about before. Uh, you know, I I feel like a lot of my uh, recent poems have been about people leaving a lot of goodbye poems, uh, very much in the tradition of ancient Chinese poetry. Um, but, but I, uh, one thing that I, 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 one of the lines that I had was, uh, we don't have friends here anymore. We have friend generations and we sort of see them leave, uh, and then that closes the era. Then you have to make a whole new group of friends. Anyway, um, to answer your question, um, so Beijing Cream was, uh, a blog that I founded back in 2000. Nine, eight, no, 2010, 2010, uh, in February 2010, I believe. And um, that was during the uh, golden age of the China blog. So this was before WeChat. This was before Sina Weibo. Um, this was uh, this was when when there were a lot of, I guess you would call them now, independent uh, media people. Uh, journalists, and you, uh, maybe not journalists, but just a lot of people interested in China and who wanted to have their voices heard. Um, and at that point, I'd been here for uh, t three years, and I was, uh, you know, I was freelancing. I had time, and I thought that I had things to say about the city. And um, it was kind of founded as, as a lot of things are in Beijing after just a series of uh, late night bar sessions uh, as you know with a friend named Robert Foyle Hunwick who's also in um, oh well he's English but he's uh, he's currently in South America but um, but uh, RFH and I just thought we could we could be entertaining we could be um, informative and we could be truthful about what we saw and uh, and the blog somehow snowballed it uh, you know more and more readers came on and then I kind of got obsessed with looking at the site reader and trying to attract more readers and it you know it was never um it was never paying uh we were never really successful in that sense but we kept getting readers and and it became I'd like to think pretty successful in in the three years that I was doing it full time I stopped doing it because I got a job at the bookworm and um you know the bookworm was 
was the nexus of intellectual life in, in the city. It was a meeting place for foreigners and locals alike. Um, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a restaurant, it was a bar, um, a cafe, and an event space, all in one. Um, oh, and, and, a, and a bookshop, of course. Uh, uh, there was a library. It was a library. You could rent books from there. Um, I, I don't know if many people did, but um, there was nothing like it. And uh, I have to give most of the credit to the, uh, the boss at the time when I was there, Peter Goff. Uh, also, you know, former journalist. And then after the bookworm closed, he went back into journalism. Um, but he... Uh, he was idealistic in the way I think a lot of journalists are, and in this case, uh, a lot of book owners, a lot of bookstore owners are, um, which is to say he sort of always knew that as a business model, it wasn't going to work, um, but he was still determined to do it the right way, which is uh, to give the city, to give the people a place to express themselves, to exchange ideas. Um, and in that spirit, he did, uh, he organized, uh, you know, he didn't found this, uh, the book storm, the, the book worm was founded by someone else, but he was one of the early investors. But anyway, but he was the central figure in the bookworm literary festival for most of the years that it, that it happened. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be a coordinator of that festival of the ninth, 10th and, um, uh, well, basically the ninth and 10th editions and then helped out with the 11th edition as well. Um, I feel like that was, in some ways, those years, and I don't want to get these years incorrect, um, I believe that was 2017 and 18, uh, maybe 2019, uh, I apologize, uh, some, the dates, uh, they, they blend together in my head, but, um, that, in, in a sense, was the last hurrah of... 2019 was the last one. Okay, then um, then 16, 17. I, or maybe the first... Maybe, do you have this information available? The ninth festival was what year? Was that 15 or 16? Um, when was the 10th anniversary? Was that 2018? So perhaps ninth was 2017? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> there are many, yeah. Um... But the the bookworm the bookworm the book the bookworm literary festival was um, uh, more than an oasis in the desert, wasn't it? It was a, an absolute carnival in the desert. It was the one event every year in March that would be guaranteed to draw people from every single part of the city. Um, there would always be so it would be two and a half three weeks three weeks of uh, three weekends it, it extend three weekends but two full weeks of events, uh, literary and otherwise, you know, there'd be music, um, there'd be panel discussions, uh, book launches, um, you know, Splatoon has done things there. Uh, there would always be, uh, we would always invite the winner of, um, that year's, uh, Australian slam poetry, national slam poetry contest. Like that winner would always come and give a performance. And that was always like one of the most popular shows. There'd always be a comedy. And then toward the end, I was doing pub quiz, um, yeah, a carnival, a celebration. Um, you know, the model was a celebration of literature and ideas. And I think that that second part of it, of ideas, is so important because there were so few places. In fact, I don't know any other place in Beijing that really gave all of its participants, and that's everybody on stage and everybody in the audience who got to ask questions, um, a platform to say whatever they wanted. Now that got the bookworm in trouble. Uh, we got fined for quote unquote fire code violations. Uh, Peter got asked to go to the police station for half a day, for a full day, for no reason, no reason, except for the kind of events they were that they were holding. But by that time, they were uh, such an institution, and they were so well known and so well respected because. You know, the, the local government, the Sinatran government, likes to promote the bookworm as a symbol of what is possible in China to kind of say to all the naysayers, well, hey, look, we still allow this independent bookstore to exist, right? But yet, whenever we tried to push the envelope, we'd, we'd uh, get slapped on the wrist. Anyway, anyway, uh, I don't want to talk too much about the, the, um, 
about that dynamic, the politics of it. But um, I just, I just thought the, uh, I just thought Peter stayed very true despite very difficult circumstances to the ethos um, until the very end. And uh, and sadly, the bookworm closed in November two thousand nineteen, and it hasn't come back. And it's dearly missed because no no place has has stepped up to this place. Yeah, there's definitely there must there's like a bit of a vortex left, isn't there? Because uh, making making an arts collective like Spittoon in in uh, Beijing, the bookworm is always like a like a big brother. Or like an uncle, sort of, you know, a kind of uh, pillar to rely on, a sort of H HQ, you know, um, for activity. Um, and it was almost, you know, for, because there may be people that uh, watch this podcast that can't visualize it; they've never been. It was like almost as if the building had fallen from the heavens and landed in Sanliton, um, because it was a, a really beautiful building, and uh, you have the sort of red lanterns um, that are illuminating it from the inside and on the top of the rooftop you look across Sanitum which is the commercial district of Beijing you see the big Adidas building and all the shopping streets um, you know and sort of center of commerce that is Sanitum very very trendy and then you have the the bookworm cafe which is in the middle of it so I think that really accurately sets the scene for the creativity that we shared or experienced during that time, before and after that time. Um, well, um, you know, Sunny Twin, the bookworm, the bookworm and Sunny Twin, the development of bookworm via V Sunny Twin tells an interesting story about Beijing as well, because in the early days, um, you know, that area of Sunny Twin, j just to let people know who might not live here, uh, Sunny Twin is the nightlife and entertainment center of Beijing. And uh, it was very rowdy, 10, 12, 14, 16 years ago. It was a place of degeneracy, <laughs> even. Uh, and the bookworm was... Dirt Street? Well, Dirty Bar Street. Bar Street, was, uh, Bar Street, yeah. Dirty Bar Street doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, we all call it Dirty Bar Street. Anyway, um, yeah, all of that got cleaned up. But um, but the bookworm was... Uh, you said you used the word oasis earlier. It was. It was, it was a beacon of civility amid muck. But then suddenly it turned into something else. And you mentioned the Adidas building. And then uh, eventually there was this gaudy uh, hotel, the ICBC, um, the Intercontinental. I mean, sorry, not ICBC, Intercontinental, the IC uh, that got built. And uh, suddenly it turned into this symbol of Beijing wealth and blitz of upper middle class of luxury. And the bookworm still was an oasis. But then it was one of, um, of, modesty, I suppose. It, it was a brick and mortar bookstore. Uh, how many of those still exist in the world, you know? Um, but it's very interesting that it, it sort of, it always sort of retained its own, it, itself, its true essence. It never strayed from that while everything around them sort of tried to find itself. But not even find itself, tried to find a way to be fashionable. You've managed to encapsulate the development of Beijing very well in that analogy because the city has developed so quickly and so fast over the last 20 years um, and uh, as you said the bookworm was a kind of oasis of civility from the outset but then as as it became more commercialized it became a kind of oasis of um, how would you describe it sort of a, there's something quite maverick about it yeah, the bookworm always knew what it was like a free stage a bar yeah, yeah, like it, it was always a bar and space and restaurant. It was always those things. It always had books inside, but it always knew what it was. And um, I, I feel like a lot of establishments here don't. And I feel like a lot of people here don't. And the longer one stays, I think the more one questions whether they really know themselves, whether they belong, especially talking about, I'm talking about expats specifically, foreigners. Um, and I feel that more and more these days, uh, not just because of the pandemic and so many people leaving because of that, but um, but just it seems like China has less and less need of foreigners, and therefore, what are we doing here? You know, um, not to not to get us into a subject if that we're not that we're potentially not ready to broach. We could broach any subject here, Anthony. Um, we're looking at the 
we're under the umbrella of Splatoon and art scenes in China, but I think that setting the social context is extremely important because, um, you know, to put it bluntly, foreigners in China um, all have visas and are all there for reasons which amount to employment um, or perhaps that, you know, they may be married to, to locals or so that's definitely a, a factor in relation to their relation to the city. Um, I've recently uh, finished some assignments. I've been doing uh, various marketing courses in Spatoon as a subject, and it's allowed me to kind of philosophize about it a bit more uh, and understand it. And I think that um, innovating, because you know, that if we take if we take ourselves outside of China and look at China from a Western perspective, and if I you know re-inhabit my body as a 23 year old man before I moved to China. Uh, I didn't know much about the place and all we had were the stories that we'd heard uh, about its recent past um, and then that you know obviously encourages uh, perhaps unfair depictions about how it might be within the within the country and all of those um, predispositions that they're all blown away when you move there and you actually experience what it was like and you know the sort of uh, opportunities and the wildness and the possibilities of the place um, were really compelling and um, my experience doing something like Splatoon was that um, ironically you could get away with an awful lot um, as long as you weren't pushing the wrong buttons um, and um, not just getting away with but taking advantage of people's desire to want to uh, create things like for example in Beijing the venues that we use uh, we don't pay for those venues you know we have uh, partnerships with those venues uh, that require them to to be free um, and you know we'll, we'll bring crowds or whatever and we'll, we'll bring paying customers but the entire framework that you would expect creating an organization in the West does not apply to Beijing it still has that Mad Max quality that's very inspiring would you agree or is that is that eroding uh, are things becoming more predictable is it becoming harder to innovate in that way seeing as you are for example the coordinator of the Splatoon Beijing Collective maybe that's a good segue for you to talk about uh, our activities as a collective in the city now uh, whether things are easier whether they're harder what's your opinion about that kind of thing the idea of um it's not so different trying to create a poetry night in England, is it? Like you would, uh, you could probably find a venue, a bar that lets you use it for free once every month. Yes, um, yes and no. Right, like that aspect at least. That's true, yeah. But I suppose there's a, there's a sort of gl glitz and character to the event in Beijing where you take over the whole venue and it becomes the core soul of the event. If I wanted to approach a pub here, because the whole poetry scene putting events on thing is so ubiquitous and normal over here which is why which is why it traveled well to Beijing because there wasn't really anything like it outside of the bookworm for foreigners um, the sort of English language um, poetry events and fiction events and stuff like that but um, I suppose yeah uh, you know it would be possible to get like a, a room but it wouldn't be the whole the vibe of the whole venue wouldn't be focused on that particular event. It wouldn't have the special quality that it has over there. I suppose uh, that's one of the other characteristics. It wouldn't be special. Right. Um, that's one of the characteristics of uh, the city is that um, it's just barely big enough to have enough people interested in everything. So, uh, so whatever club, whatever activity you can think of, um, that probably exists here. Uh, but it's small. Um, just small enough that there can only just be one, <laughs> right? So in in um, you know in your city in uh, in Congleton, um, are you in Congleton or Manchester right now? I'm in Sheffield now. Sheffield, in Sheffield, Sheffield. Oh. Sheffield. Sure. Well, I could have named any English city in Sheffield. I bet there are multiple poetry nights. Um, it seems like there would be. Um, um, but here, there's there's just there's one. There's one that's been going every month for six years, right? Um, and and people have rallied behind Splatoon and they continue to do so. 
um, that actually, you know, as a sign of the health of, of I suppose, poetry and uh, of creativity and uh, just general activity and interest in doing things, um, there, there have been other poetry nights that have been organized, you know, um, in the last, in the last six months. Um, I think that's a great thing. Uh, but Spittoon has only grown and, um, you know, since you left and passed along hosting duties to me, um, I guess now it would be a year and a half ago, right? In uh, the summer of 2020, we've had, uh, we've had packed houses every single time on Poetry Night. And um, I, I don't know exactly what that says about the evolution or if it does say anything about, about the organization. Um, I just think, I just think the interest is there as unsurprisingly, um, I think there should be interest in, um, in poetry and expression in, in, in these sorts of events at every cosmopolitan city. Um, and, and I think I, you know, one thing that I've been really encouraged by is how many Chinese people now come to these events, you know, um, like four years ago when we were holding meetings at uh, the ball house, sometimes it would just be the, the 10 readers plus a couple of their friends, right? It didn't, it didn't seem like it was a thing, it, it, an event as much. Um, whereas now, whereas now it is, and you know, whenever we put a call out that gets snapped up right away. And of course, Spittoon has grown into all these other events too. So fiction and storytelling and book club. And so, you know, that's run by uh, the poetry workshop run by Abigail. So Anna does fiction, uh, David does um, book club and uh, Amy Gamble does storytelling. And those are all very successful too. And I kind of wonder, um, I don't know the answer to this. I wonder if the, the pandemic brought us closer together and um, maybe people, maybe people were more actively looking for things to do uh, when, when lockdowns in Beijing were sort of were lifted in, um, in April, 2020. Um, and maybe, maybe they came to us and they just kept coming and, you know, and it, it's a word of mouth thing too, you know, uh, success breeds success. Yeah, there are opportunities uh, in chaos as well. I mean, I remember at the the Christmas of, I think it was December 2019, we had uh, a big meeting at my girlfriend's apartment in Dongjiman, um, and we had a big video call with representatives of the collective outside of China, uh, and within China, but in Hong Kong. Um, and we were starting to build these plans, um, major plans for international uh, efforts and obviously COVID came and completely blew all of that out of the water. Um, everybody from their respective countries and communities obviously looked into those communities and kind of shriveled away understandably and for the collective in China it became all about China and that was the you know that was a it was a, a healthy thing as well because it provided community during those strange times for the people that were there and it was quite compelling wasn't it because we were trying to fight to find a way for poetry to exist even though all the venues were closing down and um that that forced us to innovate to try to live stream we had the that special spittoons event at soma studio um, as well so that also ev even though our carefully laid plans for international um, or world domination were blown away that still allowed us to focus on our local communities yeah I remember so the last city outside of China the last city outside of the mainland borders that I uh, visited was Hong Kong I came back in um, February 2020 uh, from there and um, uh, establishing a connection with Hong Kong, the Hong Kong creative scene was something that I was really interested in doing. And that was one of the things that we talked about in that, at that, um, that December, 2019 meeting at, uh, um, at your girlfriend's Ophelia's place, Ophelia's place. Um, but, um, 
Hmm. You know, uh, I, I'm glad that we did experiment in the early days of the uh, then the epidemic, not even the pandemic, uh, with live streaming and and remote uh, events. But it turns out the you know the <laughs> The, the lockdown didn't really last all that long, right? It was late March, early April when we were back at, um, I remember the big, the big sort of um, welcome back to, to the to live, live shows thing happened at uh, Tribute Bar uh, when it seemed like the entire music community was, was in, that, in that small little bar in Dongeman. But then that's how we found Camera Stylo and they've been such mm -hmm. a reliable partner um, a reliable venue for, for all of this between events and they're just perfect, you know? Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know if we would have found them. So. What about the morale of, um, because to, to, to add even more context for our, for our viewers, um, you know, COVID has happened and I think that, uh, between the West and the East or China and the West, at least, um, there's a competition for how free we can be. <laughs> Um, you know, as, as uh, we all lock down over here in um, summer 2020 uh, in China, because it was so contained, uh, people were living relatively normal lives. But whenever whenever there is a rash of coronavirus cases, you know, they, the China tends to lock down entire cities. Um, and uh, more broadly speaking, China's border has been locked down ever since, you know, the pandemic was a pandemic. Um, and people can leave, but they can't come back. So you have this like quite interesting phenomenon where foreigners, you know, you know, clearly with families back home and lives back home, haven't been able to visit those families for years now, right? So what you have is that, um, because it was very normal to, to go to China, live your life, you know, as an expat, and then maybe once, perhaps twice, come back to see family and have various plans in your in your respective home countries. But that hasn't been the case. So foreigners have literally been pickled in China for two to two and a half years um, creating projects and, um, you know, uh, building friendships without that kind of quote unquote reality check of moving back to, you know, to their families and speaking to their friends from back home. So maybe you can expound on that a little bit like um, not necessarily just negatives. Have there been positives as well? And, What's the feeling like over there on the other side um, in relation to that? And how are people feeling about not being home for such a long time? Is it just a, is it just a, a general feeling of homesickness or is it more nuanced than that? There's, there's a little bit of cabin fever uh, or island, island fever. Um, I, it just feels like, it feels like um, as the world has gone back, has completely opened up. You know, it wasn't too long ago, um, uh, Australia and New Zealand opened their borders, right? Um, it just feels like China is becoming more and more isolated. And we, along, along with that. Um, you know, the positives, I, I guess, I suppose, uh, I suppose it, there are people who really love the life that they live, you know, the lifestyle, um, whatever that might be. Um, it could be, uh, going to, you know, they've got this food group where they just check out restaurants in the city. Um, or it could be people who really love, um, underground music or, uh, going to, going to nightclubs, you know, uh, BBB is, is like the new, the new one that everyone goes to. Um, there are a lot of, um, if you really enjoy the life that you live, then I think, I think you've had more opportunities to find others who share your interests. And, um, and, and maybe out of that, you get projects, you get these creative projects, uh, creative or otherwise that you maybe wouldn't have had. Um, generally speaking though, I, I think, you know, I speak for myself, but also lots of other people in saying that I think we would love to be able to travel. We'd love to be able to, you know, um, visit friends, uh, to just pop on over somewhere else for a little while, uh, 
the C family, uh, be able to come back, you know, uh, even, even, even to be able to travel to like another province without worries that we won't be able to, or that to worry without worrying that we need to do quarantine when we come back. Um, yeah. but of course, there's, there's no, I suppose what, what adds, what adds to the frustration is that there, there isn't an end in, an end in sight. The, the end may be around the corner, but the, it's very difficult inside and outside China to have insight about when it's going to end. Right. No one knows. Right. Um, if you look closely, would you right? agree with that or mostly, I mostly agree with that. If you look closely, you can see that the lockdowns that are happening now are, are already of a different nature than the lockdown that happened in the past. Um, there are, for instance, like if you come out of a COVID hospital, you only have to, you know, do a home quarantine for seven days as opposed to 14. Um, there's, uh, there's this public push for, uh, dynamic COVID zero, which is not that different from COVID zero, but it's, it's at least moving the right direction. Um, even though, even though people are still very serious about, about various restrictions, um, I think there've been hints at trying something else. So, uh, so if Omicron was spreading again during the summer, for instance, I think we could reasonably expect that the reaction would, would not be as severe as it has been in the last month, right? So we're moving that direction. It's slow. And in the end, there's still a lot of questions that people, do, um, that, that, that are unanswered and that, as you say, we can't answer until the government just tells us, Hey, now, now we're back to normal. And I think that can happen very suddenly, but anyway, everyone's thinking that after the meetings in October, things will be okay. I don't know. We'll see. So I, I, I always remember, you know, um, telling you when we were drinking in, uh, the many times that we were drinking together in China, that you have a certain bardic quality in relating in, in relation to reflecting current times through the poetry that you write. I remember, you know, we've mentioned the, uh, the project Poetry X Music. You created an album, um, an entire album inspired by the lockdown and the onset of coronavirus in China. Um, so, is it continuing? Are the um, how, how, how should I phrase this? Is the, is the context of the current situation continuing to have such, such an influence on your work? You know, you, you mentioned that you've been writing sort of, uh, poetry, poetry of goodbye recently. Maybe you could tell me a little bit more about that. Um, and, and some of your current inspirations. Yeah. You know, when Leanne and I worked on here to stay, which is the name of that album, um, um, here to say, here to stay, referring to the virus. Um, it was a cathartic experience, you know, uh, that was, uh, that was in February, 2020. So that was when it first happened, when, when it was at its peak, when, um, people were most afraid of it. And it was just really interesting to observe, um, how the neighborhood reacted to it and then how, uh, just kind of zoom out from there, right. From, from yourself, the neighborhood the streets, society at large, the country, and then the world. Uh, and then you begin thinking about things like, well, how will this change the world? And what will, what will it be like when the virus is gone? Um, and I suppose, I suppose, um, in that sense, <clears throat> the ongoing pandemic is, is still influencing my work, uh, just because everything around me, you know, the life that we live and, um, the people that we encounter and the policies that affect us are always finding their way into one's work. Perhaps you could tell me some, you know, exact poems or, or musical projects that you may be thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you asked about the, uh, the poetry of eyes. Go ahead. It feels like more and more people well, it's true. It's true that more and more people are leaving at a faster rate. But even before the pandemic, you know, in 2019, I, I had an existential crisis about 
what I was doing in Beijing. And I was wondering if I should leave because I'd seen so many other people leave, you know, and then you left in 2020 and every, every departure feels more and more like a betrayal. And with each one that happens, I feel less forgiving of the people who leave, you know, and I've got to channel those feelings because, um, I don't, I don't mean that literally. I, I'm not like, no, it's good. It's good. Um, a good way of looking at it. I'm not, I'm not bitter, but, but like I, I told you, you know, I, I consider, uh, I think of it as a, as, as a death in some ways. You know, I can't believe even now that I'm conversing with a ghost. Um, and your departure, of course, uh, of course, you know, this, uh, inspired a poetry X music piece called the devil. <laughs> Couldn't think um, possibly why. I think, I think through creative work, I sort of, uh, work through how I feel about, um, a lot of things. And, um, and this in particular, uh, I think, I think, I think I'm also grappling with some sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm grappling with my own sense of, of my Beijing mortality, uh, if that makes sense. Um, because, because in the end, really all of us. All of us are just passing through, um, um, again, with, with a few exceptions, but, um, but there are, as one gets older, the question of, of whether you should stay. And I think more importantly, who you might be outside of the city, uh, what can you do? What purpose can you find somewhere else? Uh, do you even fit in wherever you came from? Uh, those questions become more pointed and, uh, and yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, it's a, it's a fine little thing to mine for creative material. I'll tell you that much. Oh, 100%. I think you've done a good job of nailing it down and, uh, oh, we have a, a pong yo there, a, a xiao mao. Meow. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's Ovid. Ovid, yeah. Purposes of the recording, Anthony has, I think you have three cats. Is that right? Mm, mm. Three little cats that in the hotel correct. apartment. Yeah. I can hear them now. Um, that yeah, that's a great analogy. I, I often say that you know you have two two deaths as an expat. You have a little death, and then you have the place in which you decide to die in, which is you know usually where you're ironically where you're from. You, you know that there is the little death is leaving the place that you're an expat in. Um, and it, it does feel a little bit, a bit like a death as well, because um, if you arrange it correctly, you're probably going to have some kind of event, just like I did, where you say goodbye to your friends. And um, however, however you try to put it off, there is a final moment where you will look back, see your friends for the final time and take a snapshot, a mental snapshot of those friends before you turn around and leave the door. Um, and that's um, probably not the last time you'll ever see them, but the last time you'll ever see each other in that context ever again. And there's something quite analogous to, um, and not to take away from the, the intensity of a soldier's life, but being in a kind of like situation where you're in a foreign place and have very intense relationships with people and then have to leave them immediately. Very much like how I imagine um, a soldier would feel in a fighting unit in some foreign war, right? Um, just, just, just because you, you know, you develop these very intense relationships with, with friends, because in a way you're, you're, you're kind of colliding against the environment that you share because it's, it's not where, it's not the culture where a lot of people grew up, you know, you're expat and you know, you create this culture together and you help each other and the connections that you have are very important. And, all of a sudden, immediately, you have to let it go all at once. Uh, and everybody that you leave behind ossifies in their youth, um, in that moment, in that snapshot. And um, I think that, it, that that is a very inspiring thing. It's also very sad and it is a bit like a death. So I would agree. And I can say that, as it were, posthumously uh, in agreement uh, on my side of the world. Um, and that's to ha and ha how it feels. I'm very lucky to have moved over with my girlfriend, Ofeli, because she um, is an, an, an old hand as well, Beijing hand. She was there for 12 years. So we frequently have discussions about it. Um, so to summarize that, I think that 
even though you have the implicit sadness, that's also a creative gift, isn't it? Because you have this um, very, uh, very compelling and, and sad and interesting narrative of, uh, of, of the expat, you know, and about leaving and all the sights and sounds and smells of the place that you occupied. Sure, sure. And, and those change and, you know, poems are snapshots. And that's why it's so important, I think, to, to write it down because um, you need to crystallize that. Um, you're never going to, but, you know, I think, I think poems are really great at crystallizing the feeling of what you feel at the time. Um, in a sense, uh, better than photos. Um, cause, uh, cause yeah, things change. You know, when I was young, I, um, I was kind of, um, I was always, I always dreaded, um, I dreaded what had not, had it, had it, losing what wasn't lost. Um, I was nostalgic for things that weren't lost yet, you know, and, and I think part of that was fearing that when I got old, older, all I would do is look back on youth. And that hasn't been the case. That actually hasn't. Um, one of the, one of the unexpected gifts of, of growing older, I don't want to say old, but you know, growing older aging is that uh you don't actually care as much the mind does this thing where it makes you forget about about the things that you did when you were young um about your athletic glory and you know how fit you were and how much stamina you had it's it just it, the body does this thing where it's like eh, you know what? you're now living in the present and uh, you live more and more in the present as you grow older. Anyway, all of which is to say it's important to write down, to keep a journal, uh, to write poems every day and, uh, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I, I just want to say, so I don't forget. I think that, um, that's a great point. I, I think that, um, there's a sequence to life, um, that may be even more discernible by having that, you know, um, shimmering wall that you need to walk through as an expat it's like i need to graduate from this life to move on to this life or i'm haunting this place i'm not i'm not progressing i'm not aging i'm not moving to the context of the next place uh, and it's easy to get stuck right so um yeah it's about being in the right place at the right time um I don't know. Using that analogy hasn't been as incisive as, as, as I wanted, but I, I think that that was part of the reason why. And as you mentioned before, people leave at the times that they do in Beijing. That there's a kind of almost kind of you have to make an agreement with the city. It's a bit like you know playing dice with the devil, or like um, there's a game that you play where China or not just China, being an expat anywhere, it's like, I'm going to take this much of your time. I'm going to take this much of your youth. And then in a way you have to kind of arrange it. So you say, well, I'm going to take these experiences, right? And I'm going to take these lessons to be able to compound them in the future. And that's the trade off. That's the gamble that you make with the time. And some people win the game more than others. And some people really lose the game. Um, but that, 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 that's kind of how it feels like when you're gambling with your time as an, as an expat, which is basically gambling with your time in a place that you don't plan to stay in or which won't afford you, uh, the context that you need as an aging person, right? It's like, it's a good place to be young basically. Um, but I mean, it's different for everybody, you know, I was just going to say the young expats that I, meet, <laughs> the young expats I meet now seem to have more of a purpose than the, the, uh, the expats around me when I was young. Um, one of the ways that the city has changed. Sorry, tell me what you mean by that. I just mean, um, I think the, the people here, the people that come to China now, they want to get, they, they are more um, clear about what they want to get out of this experience, uh, kind of what you were alluding to. I think fewer people are, are just are gambling with their youth, are uh, sort of just taking things a day at a time, you know, um, going out and having fun, finding, t you know, one English gig, uh, and to another. Um, I think that's, um, 
I think that's partly a result of some policy changes. You know, it's harder to get a visa to stay here. Uh, this was true pre-pandemic as well. It was harder in 2018 to remain in China. Uh, you know, it feels like back in 2008, you could come here on a tourist visa and then and just do a lot of tur- uh, you know tutoring jobs, and you'd be fine. I, it feels like there were more agencies that were giving uh, that were selling visas on the gray market. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a greater point to make here. Just uh, one of the another one of the ways in what the city is changing. You're touching on, on a much larger point there, though, uh, which we can talk about very briefly. Where for the last twenty years, um, it's been well. I mean, for that, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, up to that point, it was very easy for for foreigners to come over, which created a kind of or a type of foreigner that would come over uh, to have experiences and to have like a a relatively easy job and you know a kind of interesting life of it in China and that that's a like a type of expat that we're seeing less and less of um, you know basically I'm talking a, a lot of English teachers would come over and teach English and have experiences in China and live there but that's becoming harder and harder to do which actually f- affects the demographic of of people who are accessing um, Beijing and China to create projects as well, right? Like they used to. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I believe that any place that's diverse, uh, more diversity is always a good thing. And, you know, there's n- absolutely nothing wrong with teaching language uh, because because that's a gateway to other things, to other interesting things. If you stay here because you're interested in the culture. And by the way, this you can say about Beijing expats to their credit versus Shanghai expats, for example, is that I think the people that stay here, because the city is grittier, because it's not as pretty, because it's not as easy, they really love something about um, about it that goes a little bit deeper. Um, it, they're not just having fun, a good time. They're not just, you know, um, yes, uh, whatever. It's just... They want to learn more about the culture and they want to integrate a little bit more with the, with the community, whatever community it happens to be. Okay. Um, and I think that's a good thing. And, and yes, it is sad that there's less of that. I think that we've, we've touched on a lot today. We've talked about, um, your history, your, your past, we talked about your projects, but we've also talked about the context of Beijing, talked about COVID, um, just to, to cap our conversation, we'll, we'll end soon. I'd like you to just give me your brief thoughts about how you see the future. Um, maybe you can look through a spittoon lens and see your future through that spittoon lens, but talk about yourself and talk about spittoon. How are the next few years going to look? Uh... An intense question. <laughs> it's, it's very hard because because you presume that I'll be here <laughs> in two years. Um, I don't, I, I, I think Splatoon will be fine. I think, I think, um, I think that's one of the beauties of it. And I think you've talked about this before too, is that it doesn't need, it doesn't require, unlike some organizations, we, and we've had conversations about this, um, where I have said that once the founder of a thing leaves, or once the, once the uh, owner of a restaurant no longer works there the quality goes down right and, and you've always insisted that spittoon was always something greater that that um it didn't you know that sure it came from a place but but it doesn't derive all of its energy from that point rather it sort of spread out and now they're kind of roots growing up popping out from from everywhere um and if one gets stamped out another one will grow I think I think Splatoon will remain strong. I think it'll be fine. Um, I think even if it never becomes a, an official organization, if it never gets incorporated, if it never makes money, um, there will still be people that go to Splatoon branded events. Um, and and if and if we were to leave and come back in five years, and we saw Splatoon on a poster, I'm pretty sure we would go right. Um, for that well for nostalgia factor but also um because because i think the, the reputation 
of the organization is that is that we do things that are um, that are authentic, that uh, that aren't for business purposes, and it's not to alter your motives. You know, it's not to make a career or anything. It's just because we want we want a platform to exist for people to express themselves. As long as the people in charge remember that, it'll be fine. And if if Splatoon no longer does that, someone else will, right? Um, and that's fine. Yeah, good answer. And uh, as, as we know, there's a policy within Splatoon of name your successor. Whatever role that you have, when it's time to leave, you find someone to take that role up. Um, which is what I did with you, actually. I was the Beijing coordinator myself, and now now you are. Um, so it's it's been a great way to make friends. I'm going to ask you as well, um, Anthony, um, through the power of editing, if you want, you can run off now and get me one of your poems and read the poem um, as a kind of, uh, one of, perhaps one of the poems that you talked about, and I could quickly just edit it so you appear out of the ether. Um, before you read a poem to finish, I'm going to ask you my two questions, which I will ask in each um, podcast. Number one, Anthony Tao, what is the plight of poetry? Do I need to presume poetry has a plight? Um, no, it's, yeah, no, that's my answer. I, I don't, I, it doesn't exist. Okay, number two, you, um, you have to take a poet... To, or you have to live with a poet on a desert island. Um, I'm not suggesting it's you and the poet's book of poetry. It's the personality. It's the poet, him or herself. Who is the poet that you would choose to live with on a desert island for eternity and why? <laughs> uh, hmm. That's a really tough one. I think. Um, hmm. Follow your heart. Uh, maybe Sylvia Plath. Um, I feel like uh, we could have some really deep conversations, really soulful conversations. So you, you'd like to live on an island with Sylvia Plath because of the deep and soulful conversations? I think I'm going to have to go with that answer for now. <laughs> Good. Excellent. So uh, thank you for that, Anthony. Uh, we're going to move towards ending this podcast now. Before we do, I'm going to invite you to read one of your poems, which might be a really good way to end it. So this one um, is uh, is one of my more recent ones, and it speaks to what I said earlier about feeling like feel what I said earlier about how living in Beijing feels like you're being secluded, feels like you are secluded. It's called Winter 2022, Beijing. The stars were out. We couldn't help but notice all 20 or so of them. Orion's belt and one of the dippers. The sky was pale, the cosmos's printer low on toner, but the moon shone anyway. A hunter and bull were up there somewhere, like all the interesting people out there somewhere, scattered by I don't know, divinity or COVID. And fate, what surprises remain stored, locked down. It was too cold to tempt it. So we went home where there was no one and nothing to upset. And then um, Matt, I think I will, uh, I do want to read the poem that, that I uh, wrote on the occasion of your departure because I think it um, alludes to a lot of the things that we talked about, about, you know, people leaving and stuff. Um, and, um, and I remember, you know, I remember, so there's a, there's a, there's a quote in here directly from you. 
where you say it's the end of fairyland, now we must return to duty. Um, I use the word fairyland to, to sort of describe, you know, Beijing. And I, I kind of kind of thought of it as Neverland, uh, sort of before Michael Jackson uh, ruined, ruined that concept. Uh, but the idea that like, you know, we're all Peter Pan and we don't really grow up or, you know, these, uh, we're living in this adult amusement park, right? Anyway, uh, here's, here's the poem. I'm going back, Matt said. And there he was, back in the life where he was meant in Manchester. Ex-musician married with baby on the way, in the way life is meant. Not here in the deep hours of a Beijing night across a sour IPA, baiting reply with a vigorous stare, eager to cut down our desperation for meaning, for documentation, for days when we've grown old on the seats of prefab pubs, mutilating our stories for the pleasure of strangers, but knowing what truths we cherish enough to preserve. It's the end of fairyland. Now we must return to duty. For a brief moment, I'm there with him on the Congleton soil, which is the pavement of a call center, England's roots needling out of his pores, Ireland twined around bones of the dead, cigarette cindering between fingers, alcohol thickening in the blood, eyes fixed upward, the forgotten rising like water, clamor until there are drums, there is poetry. There is a stage for us to shout everything we pray will last. Reverie and rain during some charmed spring escapade. Peak and clang and smoke and then the painful brightness of a 7 a.m. sun through which we stumble, our ears still ringing to a dreamless sleep. <laughs>